American Medicine Today. The information and opinions expressed are solely those of American Medicine Today and are not the opinions of the station, its affiliates, management, or employees. Coming up on American Medicine Today, can a change of diet really help you combat a brain tumor? We travel to the University of Florida where a team of doctors shows up the incredible potentials of something called the ketogenic diet. Then we go for a ride with retired Marine and construction worker, Brian Layton, and he tells us about how the Benati Spine Institute fixed his failed back surgeries from another facility. Finally, Dr. Benati speaks with a friend of the program, Dr. James Pinckney, about his recent article on physician burnout in America. What measures can be taken to secure the stable future of our practicing doctors? Find out, coming up on American Medicine Today. Featuring cutting edge science and medical innovations, touching personal stories of recovery from pain and political issues plaguing our health care. This is American Medicine Today. Brought to you by the Bonatti Spine Institute and Alfred Bonatti, MD. Dr. Brent Reynolds, professor of neurosurgery at the University of Florida Health at Gainesville has focused his research on neuro stem cells in the brain, which produce new stem cells. His lab slowly evolved into a cancer research facility when they began focusing on cancer stem cells. Now it's very interesting, um, and it's a very big word, mm -hmm. glioblastomas. Did I say that properly? Yeah, it is, correct. Can you tell us what those are, and why are they so deadly? So it's a type of brain tumor. It's also referred to as a grade four brain tumor, and quite often we grade cancers based on the seriousness of it, um, grade one being the lowest and grade four being the worst. So it's the worst of type of brain tumors to get. Um, it has a terrible diagnosis, and usually time of diagnosis to time of death is somewhere around 12 to 15 months. The tumor typically shows up in the cortical or outer part of the brain, but it can really be found anywhere. Since brain tumors grow within the skull and are hard to detect, their diagnosis often comes rather late. And so it's almost always deadly. It's almost universally fatal. The, probably the five-year survival is 1%, 2% of patients. And what are the symptoms? How would one know if they might have one of these? Typically what will happen, so because it's you know, encased in here, you know, in this small little head of yours, this bony structure, is it's not like you get a lump on your skin or something like that. And so you don't diagnose it until you get some sort of neurological deficit. So you might be getting really bad headaches, you might have vision problems, patients will have seizures, you may have some motor difficulties. You go into the doctor, they do a brain scan, and they see this great big tumor sitting there. Dr. Reynolds has discovered that a specific diet appears to slow the growth of progressive brain tumors in mice. What feeds into the tumor's growth? Are they sugars and that makes the tumors um, start to grow? So there's a lot of things that do that. Um, one is the genomics of it. Mm -hmm. So pathways that cause cells to grow, pathways that tell cells to stop growing are dysregulated in cancers in most tumors. However, one of the things that tumors use, they blow through tons of glucose. The reason tumor cells go through a lot of glucose is they're just metabolically active, like crazy, right? These cells are like dividing. And so that brings us to sort of your findings where um, if you regulate glucose in your diet, it can probably help well, with, with tumor that's, growth. That's the hypothesis, right? right. You know, to, to say whether that's, you know, 100% true. That's what we're studying. That's our hypothesis and we're trying to test that. This is what got us started. Um, you know, several years ago, five or six years ago, on what was known as the ketogenic diet. It was developed in the 1920s. It was used for kids with epilepsy and found that when kids were put on this diet, their epilepsy did better. So that basically started sort of a small, you know, revolution where scientists like myself start looking at the ketogenic diet in cancer and saying, why is this helping? And how does it define help? What does it do to help? It slows down tumor growth. Okay. Now, the ketogenic diet is kind of like fasting. It mimics fasting in many ways. So it's really low in carbohydrates, like 10%, 3%, really high in fat, like 80, 90%, and then a little bit of protein. Which it almost seems to go against every diet that we're told is good. You know, we, we're always told fat is bad. Yeah, it's the highest levels is in the ketogenic diet. Why is that? So that general statement is just wrong. <laughs> um, I didn't make that to start statement. with. <laughs> That's the preconception. But, but taking that out of the taking that out of the equation, two things happen when you go on the ketogenic diet. At least two physiological things happen. Number one, because you don't have many carbohydrates, your glucose levels come down. Because your diet is is high on fat, what happens is fats gets processed and makes these things called ketone bodies. And so your ketones go up your glucose comes down. 1950s, 60s comes along, some anti-epileptic drugs come onto the market, and obviously ketogenic diet falls out of favor because the ketogenic diet looks like bacon and eggs, 
three meals a day, forever. Which uh, sounds good for a couple days. For, not, not, not forever. For a days, but not forever. <laughs> really tough to do. Dr. Reynolds decided to research ways to improve the palatability of the diet by manipulating the levels of carbs and fat. He eventually stumbled upon something called medium chain triglycerides. And so most fats, when you consume them, they you know, go into your gut, they go to your lymphatic system, they go into your blood, and then they get processed through your liver. Medium chain triglycerides, they go into your gut, they go directly to your liver via the um, hepatic portal vein, and they get processed, and they get turned into ketones. MCT is found in things like coconut oil. But you couldn't just consume coconut oil and get the same effect with the medium chain triglycerides. So it's kind of like a concentrated form of uh, extract. Now that Dr. Reynolds was able to mimic the ketogenic diet, he and his team wanted to see if they had the same effect on tumors. So we treat some animals with the ketogenic diet, we treat some animals with our high-fat, low-carb diet. And the two animals um, live about three times as long mm. as the untreated animals. And it actually mimicked identically the ketogenic diet. So how does a person take advantage of these natural therapies? For starters, go on the Atkins diet, because limiting your carbohydrates is the first step toward ketogenic results. At the same time, you would take a medium-chain triglyceride. And so, you know, there's an oil you can buy. There's actually a company that sells a powder. What you would actually find is when your carbohydrate levels come down from being on the low carbohydrate diet, and then you take the medium chain triglyceride supplement, your ketones go up. And so, you know, they will go up, you know, within like a half hour after consuming the medium chain triglycerides, your ketones go up. By doing this, you are lowering the primary energy source for tumor cell growth. It's not a cure for cancer at all, but it's something that can help shift that balance in favor of slowing down the tumor growth. And the best part is that unlike chemotherapy, there are no side effects from this simple diet change. Do you know if it's effective in other cancers or has that been tested yet? Um, so, you know, we've looked at um, some other cancers. So we've looked at lung cancer, mm -hmm. colon cancer, breast cancer, um, and we see the same kind of effect. You know, it's not going to be good for everything. Um, but we think it's going to be helpful for a lot of cancers. And so you say the next step is Appro the approval process for human trials? Yeah, so that's what we're doing right now. So we're, you know, we're working with the group at John Wayne Cancer Center in Los Angeles. Okay. We're working with our neuro-oncology group here at the University of Florida. Um, and we're working with a neuro-oncology group at Tufts University. So what we're wanting to do is have a small consortium where we can now go formally test this in a patient population to say, you know, is this going to be helpful? And the great thing about all of this is because it's just a diet, um, not only someone with cancer, but your average person. Anyone. Anybody can just start eating like that and circumvent your human trials and all of that stuff because that's a process, of course. This is something they can start doing today. Absolutely. So, so anyone could do this. What they're finding with the ketogenic diet is not only um, does it show clear benefit for people with epilepsy, but now they're starting to look at things like how it may benefit people with stroke, how it benefits kids with aut autism how it benefits um, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. So there's, there's also this very neurological focused benefit of the ketogenic diet. Dr. Reynolds and his team of incredible researchers at the University of Florida Health have shown that a simple diet change today can affect your health tomorrow. Well, thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for taking part in our show and letting us know about this technology that's shrinking brain tumors through a proper diet. Of and a diet that anyone can, can start today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming by. Make sure you stay tuned, because coming up after the break, our Back to Life segment. Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Bonatti created, perfected, and patented the Bonatti Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Bonatti invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. 50,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Over half our patients have suffered from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. After meeting Brian Layton, one could describe him as an unstoppable force. He served our nation in the military and he's worked almost every job imaginable in the construction industry. My history is construction. Uh, after the Marine Corps, I started working in heavy construction. Even before I worked for my father, he was a union carpenter. The longer I've done it, I found my body deteriorating all the time. So what I would do is I used to uh, try to figure a way that I could get into the industry and keep on working. So I opened a hearth shop 
in uh, Connecticut and I sold Harman stoves and all kinds of wood stoves and pellet stoves and you know whatever coal stoves and I used to install them and that was one thing that I, I was I had to sell the business because I was too stubborn I kept on working and lifting a 400 pound stove wasn't good to do when you had a bad back. Brian can no longer ignore the pain from years of his physically demanding career. Over the years I was really having a starting to get a lot of back pain so I went to chiropractors and everything else. Now it wasn't until probably about 90 that I had my first back operation. My wife could probably tell you exactly when it was. My name is Gail Layton. My best friend fixed me up with him years ago. Actually my best friend wanted to fix him up with my baby sister and I'd heard what an, uh, horror stories of him in the, in the Marines and I'd said there's no way you're fixing that animal up with my baby sister. I'll take him. <laughs> We've been married 40 years. In 1999, he had a, a spinal decompression. Turned out that at the time of that decompression, they actually made his spine unstable. They took too much of the bone out. So because he's a big man, he, was, he started having problems after that. I went to several doctors. I went back to the same doctor and he said, oh, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. You're too heavy, you're too you know, big, and you know we just can't do anything, you know? So I ended up finding another doctor in Connecticut that actually was willing to operate on me. And he looked at the x-rays and the MRI. He said, oh my God, I didn't do this, did I? And I said, no, it was actually another doctor. And he said, phew, you know, that made me feel very confident about this. But then back in um, 2006, he finally went through the um, spinal fusion, which was a massive surgery. He was on the table for hours and hours and hours, 13 hours. It was just exhausting. So he ended up going in there and the other doctor made my spine very weak. So he went in there and he cleaned out the spots, but he put six screws in there, three on each side, and he put bars in between, uh, you know, linking the three screws together to help support me. Well, over the years, that actually worked a way in and was pinching off some nerves and you know, God knows what. And so I, I was in steady pain constantly. And I had to work, walk with a cane because what they did is in one of the operations, somehow they did something where I couldn't push down on my toes and my feet. So I just kept on, when I leaned forward, that was it. I was done. You had to pick me up off the floor. So I went with the cane just to balance for, I've been with the cane for probably eight, 10 years now. And I just, you know, I was at wit's end when I got down here. Uh, I totally gave up. I, after the back operation, I actually went in and had my stomach stapled. I used to be almost 400 pounds at one time. And I went all the way from 400 pounds to like 250. And even then I went back to the doctors because that was their thing. You're too heavy, you're too big. I went back to the doctors and they said, nothing we could do for you, you're too big. The pain in my back was actually, went right down my whole spine into my tailbone. Uh, my shoulders were actually felt like they were on fire and my the joints in my shoulders were so sore that I could barely you know move my arms without any pain and that's why I had to be on oxycodone as I walked as I moved I'd get shooting pains down my legs almost like lightning rods going down my legs and then through my back it got towards the end that I had burning from my tailbone all the way around my waist and right into the crotch where I was numb. So it was a case that I had no life whatsoever. And when I came down here, I, uh, I was just you know, convinced that within a year's time, I'd be in a wheelchair. And to see him deteriorate um, to the point where he, he was just absolutely hopeless. He figured this was gonna be the rest of his life. Um, and he'd been told by doctors that there was, there was nothing they could do for him. He was... Um, just really resigned to probably being in a, in a wheelchair. So it was very painful to see him, um, I think there's nothing worse than to love somebody and to see them being in that kind of pain and not being able to do anything for them. And particularly when they get to the point where you're just, um, he was just absolutely hopeless. He thought he'd been told so many times that there was nothing that he would have to live like that. As they had exhausted all hope in their home state of Connecticut, Gail, determined to find help for her husband, searched online for an alternative option near their winter home in Central Florida. She discovered the Bonatti Spine Institute. I was shocked because when my wife called Bonatti Institute, uh, the uh, set up the appointment and everything else, Dr. Bonatti himself called back and talked to me. 
And I mean, I never, I know the other doctors. I knew them personally. And they would never call me for any reason to find out how I was doing or anything else. Uh, so when Dr. Benhadi himself called me, you know, I was like, I couldn't believe this. I mean, a doctor's taking his time out to call me. I was shocked. And he talked and he told me exactly what he was going to do and how he was going to relieve the pain and everything else. And then I went in for the consultation. But he gave me such a good impression from the phone call. When I went there, he actually showed me the x-rays in the MRI. And he showed me where these nerves were being pinched and everything. And he showed me the hardware in my back and everything. And he actually showed me what he was going to do. And he told me that I was going to be awake during the whole operation and I was able to watch it. And at that time, he invited my wife in and said, you can watch it too, which made me relax a lot because, you know, I've had such bad feelings, uh, bad experiences with the other operations. Having my wife in there as an advocate was like 100% more relaxing for me. Brian began his procedures in March 2016. The relief that I got is just unbelievable, but I was just amazed at what he could do. And when I got up off that table, and I figured I was gonna be in the same boat, my wife was shocked because she used to grab my hand at about three and a half feet high, and now she was at four and a half feet high because I could stand up straight. It was like, you know, like a reborn again when I was able to walk off that table and walk out and go for lunch. And it was like, I went in there at 10 o'clock, got operated on. At 12 o'clock, I was walking out on my own. Just totally unbelievable. After a very short time in recovery, him being able to stand up, walk straight, totally straight. I'd never seen him. I haven't seen him in the last 10 years since his original um, fusion that he had, be able to walk like that. I was just flabbergasted. And he, and he looked at me and he said, I don't have any pain. I just bust out crying. It was just, and every surgery that we've had has addressed a different level of the pain that he's had, a different area of the pain, different symptoms, whether the pain, um, certain levels of pain was coming down the front of the leg or the back of the leg. And, um, and to feel him now getting feeling back in his feet, he hasn't had feeling in his feet for 10 years. And now he's back to completing projects in his workshop and enjoying long rides with his better half. Now I go to the store two or three times a week. I wouldn't want to go to Home Depot or Lowell's or anything like that because the pain was so great I couldn't walk through the store. Now I'm back to going picking up uh, materials. I'm working on my shop. I, I take my trike out now. I sold my Harley and uh, I, I bought a VW trike and I've been working on that for the last 10 years. And I replaced the engine and the transmission and the linkage and you know, I'm almost getting it ready for, for me to paint. Every procedure we noticed an, an improvement of what, what, you know, every level that they were at addressed a particular symptom and it, and it resolved that symptom. So I'm just, um, I can't say enough about them. I have my husband back. My pain is virtually gone. Nothing short of a miracle. Those surgeries gave me my life back. Already, I feel like a new person. I'm going home new. I can chase my grandbaby now, I can garden, I can cook, and uh, I'm really thrilled. The outcome's been remarkable. I feel 100% better. It's like a miracle. It was phenomenal. It literally did change my life. I was in a wheelchair at that time, and uh, I left here walking. Every single pain that I had when I came here is gone. I'm ready to go home and feel great. This place is great. Thank you. Everything that they said they would do, they have done, and I'm very, very satisfied and happy with those results. I knew in surgery, in fact, I told the surgeon when he relieved the pain off the nerve. The pain is gone. I am feeling wonderful. I have no pain. I feel better than I felt in four years from the surgery. It was almost immediate relief. Today I am totally pain-free, which is just amazing. It's fantastic. It definitely works. I mean, I really don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> I'm happy. Thank you for joining us on American Medicine Today. I work with an amazing group of people, including Ethan Euchre.
Always glad to be here. <laughs> Jeff Wackstaff. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Kimberly. <laughs> and world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Benatti. <laughs> I know I'm not many scenes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Everybody's oh, throwing paper at are, each other. We're a little crazy in here, kids. Um, anyway, we have a friend of the show. He is a frequent returning guest, Dr. James Pinckney, founder mm-hmm. and CEO of Diamond Physicians in Dallas, Texas. He's here to discuss a recent article about physician burnout in America and how it may collapse the healthcare system. I agree with you, Dr. James Pinckney. How you doing, James? Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> like, hey, I, I thought they caught on. you sleeping. Yeah, right. <laughs> he fell asleep during the intro and are goofing around. Uh, now, Dr. James, this is a topic that we have yes. discussed at length on this mm-hmm. show. We've had many guests talk about it. And uh, a recent survey in the article that I read of yours showed that 45% of doctors meet the burnout criteria. What do you think is the major contributing factor to physician burnout? Fighting with insurance. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah the, the stats are pretty astounding. And, and I feel mm-hmm. like the, the, most, the major contributing factor uh, is dealing with insurance. We're spending about 60 cents on every dollar trying to collect insurance money. Mm-hmm. Claims are being denied. We've got accounts receivable 120 days in the rear. It's hard to run a business like that. And then, of course, the system itself is fractured. Doctors have to see 30, 40 patients a day. Day. The average face-to-face time with a doctor in this country is seven minutes. So that's atrocious. I can't get anything done in seven minutes. I can't establish a relationship. I can't figure out what's going on with right. the visit, let alone make a medical diagnosis in that amount of time. So the entire system has to change, has to change soon, or I feel like the healthcare system will collapse. Will you explain that? What do you mean by collapse? Because I really think it's already collapsed. And that's a good point. Right now we're hanging on by a thread, but a lot of physicians are getting out of medicine. They're so burnt out, so tired that they're either retiring, going to do something else, or just shutting down their practices. And it's not just because of the burnout aspect. From a financial perspective, primary care is dying. Physicians are actually being reimbursed less than the cost of a procedure, and you can't operate a business like that. So if we don't do something very quickly to completely revolutionize healthcare delivery, and I believe Diamond Physicians is the solution to that problem, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. And just like you said, Dr. Bonatti, we already are in a lot of trouble. Well, let me let me ask you this. I heard these conversations. We just, we just see the tremendous amount of uh, just misbehavior of American Medical Association against the physicians. Not only they are blocking the physicians uh, to be independent, at the same time they are forcing just in a cozy relationship with the, with the government, creating the CPT codes and owning those CPT codes in a certain way that they can control how the physician is going to build, what is going to build, what is going to be the elements that are going to be now manipulated by uh, fraudulent physicians practically or nursing individuals trying to tell physicians that they are not going to accept those that, that, that diagnosis or that code or that treatment. So this thing is something that I think we are very, very bad. And I'm talking about we physicians. We allowed this to happen. We have a yeah. voice and the voice is very simple. We should say no. What you think? I agree. That's a great point. You know, we are forced to practice medicine in a box. We can't order the tests and do procedures that we feel are necessary if it doesn't fit a certain diagnosis and a certain CPT code. It's ridiculous. And I don't know exactly where we lost control, but bureaucracy and managed care have taken over the system. And it's all about making money. It's not about taking care of people anymore. And and I feel like my firm, Diamond Physicians in, in Dallas, Texas, we have a solution to this problem. We're putting power back into the hands of the doctors. And this is a model made for doctors, by doctors, and we are having tremendous success transforming primary care by offering membership medicine. No more insurance. Insurance should be used for catastrophic issues, heart attacks, motor vehicle accidents, hospitalizations costing thousands, thousands of dollars. We should use our medical insurance like we use our car insurance. When you fill up your car with gas, you pay with a credit card. When you need new windshield wipers, new tires, you pay cash. When you get in an accident and it's tens of thousands of dollars worth of damage, you file an insurance claim and pay your deductible. That's what insurance is for. It's used to mitigate risk, and we've gotten away from that in healthcare, and we've got to return to the 50s and 60s where it was the patient, it was the physician, it was a cash interaction. You paid the doctor for their time, and insurance was filed 
on the back end. And I actually don't want any insurance to be filed for a routine primary care. I want it to be all out of pocket and I want insurance to be used for surgeries, for major medical, for, for catastrophes. And that's how we're going to... That is a great idea, but creates a division. You create a division between the surgical group and the medical group because the surgical group never will be able to do that. And the and the, the medical group will be able to do it easy. So organize the medical group is absolutely necessary, but organize the surgical group is extremely difficult. And that's where the insurance companies are practically uh, saying that they are going to rule the rooster. So what we need to do is we need to create a system where we can move patients you know, if we if we have an insurance company or we create our own insurance company or if we have an insurance company that perform well with us, we should be able to move the patients from one insurance company to the insurance company that is behaving good from the insurance company that is behaving bad. And if we do that, we become practically individuals that were working for free for one insurance company with the only clear information that if we need to change the patient, the other insurance company is going to take it right there and we will be able to treat that patient. That idea will save the surgical side. Your idea will will really produce a tremendous amount of input on the medical type of a group. That's right. We have a doctor. Her name is Dr. Cynthia Stewart, and she was practicing for 11 years, seeing 30 to 35 patients a day, and she was just exhausted. She was hardly making six figures. The overhead was going up. Reimbursements were going down, and she literally was going to close her practice down. She was going to get out of medicine altogether until she found out about Diamond Physicians, and she really came to us and said, thank you. I didn't know about this membership medicine model. This is amazing, and I'm going to convert my practice and stay with primary care because this this allows me a higher quality of life. I don't have to stay for four hours after I finish my day charting. I can spend more time with my patients. I can spend 60 minutes instead of seven minutes. I, I'll make more money. And at the end of the day, it's all about quality of life and why doctors got into medicine. We got into medicine to help people, not to file insurance claims and fight with the government. Great point. Thank you so much. Dr. James Pinckney, founder and CEO of Diamond Physicians in Dallas, Texas. Thank you for helping retain our medical doctors and doing something that is proactive. Thank you so much. We need to get you more often on this program so you can talk about this one more frequent. Anytime you guys want to chat. <laughs> Thank I'm you. off my schedule. <laughs> Thank right, you man. so much. I appreciate much. it. Have a good day. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the number below. You can tweet at Dr. Benati using hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you. The preceding program was a paid presentation for American Medicine Today. The information and opinions expressed are solely those of American Medicine Today and are not the opinions of the station, its affiliates, management, or employees. 